church, let's stand and praise God together. Some glad morning when this life is over. Welcome to McQueenie Baptist Church. It is so great to see you here this morning. Pray that you have come ready to worship the Lord, as the Bible says, in spirit and in truth. Right now, we're going to ask you to do a great favor for us. In your bulletin, you will see a connection card. It's a tear-off form, and we're going to ask you to take the next minute and a half to fill out that form just to let us know that you're here, uh, let us a little information about you. This is for members, visitors, both. This is how we keep up with things here at McQueenie. And so please do that during the next uh, minute and a half, and we'll collect them at the end of the service. Thank you.
Well, once again, good morning, and just so that while it's on my mind, uh, this is Bluegrass Sunday, and we have bluegrass music every first and third Sunday in the first service, and so I want to thank our bluegrass band and our choir this morning for great, great music, and thank you for being here this morning as well. When I was 31 years old, uh, I was nominated and elected and ordained as a deacon in the church, uh, church in Houston, and I was the youngest deacon in the, on the deacon in the deacon body. Uh, didn't really know what I was getting into exactly. Uh, kind of young. They, you know, the scripture says not to lay hands on on someone too soon. In other words, when they're a novice, they haven't had enough experience. I think they probably violated that just a little bit with me because I still lacked experience. But I did have one thing going for me. I had a lot of passion. Okay, I wanted to serve. And so uh, some of those older deacons took, uh, took me in hand uh, as, along with my father-in-law, who was a deacon in the church, and kind of guided my path along the way. And I have learned over the years to appreciate deacons, the deacons of the church. We're going to talk about that today because we're starting today, we're beginning the process of nominating uh, men for deacon here at McQueenie Baptist Church. And so we're going to talk about what that means. We're going to look at that. Title of the message is Let the Deacons Deke. Okay. We want the deacons doing what they're called to do. And we wonder, okay, well, what is that? Let's look at the character. Let's look at the life of a deacon. How do we know who it is that we're going to nominate? How do you know the person is the right person? Well, uh, you can do a couple of things that we're not going to specifically talk about. You can certainly pray. Ask God to give you direction. Uh, speak, to the, speak to the Lord and ask him to give you a, a, an inclination, an idea about who is right. And then you kind of go through the, the qualities we're going to talk about today and ask yourself, does this man uh, exemplify these qualities? And if so, then that's the person that you will want to nominate. And uh, trust in the Lord and ask him to give you direction in all of this. So this morning, uh, we're going to begin by talking about, first of all, that the deacon, word deacon, it's not a word that 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 particular word is found in the New Testament. It is, a, it is a transliteration of the Greek word diakonos. And the word diakonos then means servant. Very simple. It's a simple meaning. It's not complicated. In fact, you'll find that that word is used in a number of other instances other than talking about deacons. When Jesus turned the water into wine, his mother said to the diakonos, the, the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. In some of the parables, Jesus spoke about good servants and bad servants. The word there is diakonos. In Romans 13, 4, Paul tells us that pagan rulers are used by God as his diakonos, as his servants. So you can go through the New Testament and you can find lots of instances where the word diakonos is simply used in its very descriptive meaning, that it's a servant. But we could, we're going to talk in only a few places that you find in Scripture uh, is the word diakonos then uh, being applied to an office or a position or a person, a leader. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. And we're going to be looking at uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 beginning in verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 3 beginning in verse 8. And this is what it says. In the same way... Deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then, if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord, that it's, uh, it's so clear and so detailed, Lord, that it gives us a clear picture of who it is that we're looking for uh, as, as we are instructed to, to select from among ourselves men that are full of the Spirit and, and of grace. Father, we pray that you would guide us today. Open our understanding, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So we're going to look at three things this morning. We're going to look at a deacon's life, a deacon's family, and a deacon's reward. Those are the three things. You already have the answers to the question. Uh, the, first of all, we're going to talk about a deacon's life, and that is found in verses 8 through 10. It's interesting that when you look at the qualities or the characteristics of deacons, you're not really given uh, talents. You're not even told which spiritual gifts to select or who, what spiritual gifts they have. We're not told to look at their abilities. We're primarily told to look at their character. You know, in the world, people are selected for offices. Hey, we're, we're right, like getting into it right now, aren't we? We're getting into it when, when all the, 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 the uh, elections are beginning to happen and, and everybody begins uh, touting their abilities and what they can do and how they're going to deliver America and they're not going to. That's another subject. Don't get me started. They're not going to deliver America. Jesus, God will be the only one that can deliver America when we turn to him by faith. And like I said, that's not the message for today, but... That's how it is in the world. People look at people and they select people based upon what I believe are often the wrong parameters and the wrong uh, credentials. And I believe the same things that we're talking about today, if you just want to know my heart, I think the same things we're looking at for people who are deacons in the church, they ought to at least, the president ought to at least have those things. Okay, our, our, our representatives should at least exemplify those qualities. If, if God wants our deacons to, surely he wants our leaders to. But let's talk about first a deacon's life. This is one of the most important things that we're going to talk about today, the deacon's life, because it's talking about not only what he can do, but who he is. Look at this, and, and it says in the same way. Let me pause right there and just mention that in verses 1 through 7 in the same passage, in 1 through 7, we're given the, the uh, responsibilities and the qualifications of a pastor or elder in the church, okay? And so um, as, we, as we talk about that today, we just need to understand that uh, what we're talking about today is a leader in the church. In, in the same way, we're talking about pastors, now we're talking about deacons. Now, what we'll see is the deacons don't have quite as many, maybe not as specific uh, responsibilities and qualifications that you see for the pastor elder. We, in, here in our Baptist church, uh, we consider the deacons the servants, and we consider the pastors and the elders of the church being the pastors and the other staff members in the church or the elders who guide the, the everyday responsibilities of the church. So in the same way as the elders or the pastors, deacons are to be worthy of respect. In other words, they are to, they are to illustrate the same character as the pastor or the elders of the church. Not indulging in much wine and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. So let's talk about some of these qualities. First of all, it says that they must be worthy of respect. Once again, you know, you can respect people for their talents, can't you? We can have respect for someone for their, uh, their knowledge and their wisdom, their understanding. We can respect people for many things in this life. But what we are, I think what's most important, and when we truly respect someone, is when we see the kind of character that the Bible talks about. They are to be men who are worthy of respect. And I think that carries with it something more than just our abilities and, and our understanding or knowledge, uh, how much education we've had, what is our position in, in public life, all of these things. <clears throat> I think this is telling us to look at something a little bit deeper. A person who is worthy of respect. Who's worthy of respect? Well, I believe according to the word of God, a person who is worthy of respect is one who, first of all, knows Jesus Christ as their Savior and that they have a reverence for the Almighty God who created them. A person who is worthy of respect is one who has given their life to Christ and is actually living into the new life that God has given them. And that becomes apparent. Isn't it apparent when somebody is truly following Christ with all of their heart? Doesn't that character rise to the surface and cause you to look at them with great respect? That's the person who is not going to make a decision based upon how much money he can make. But it's a person who makes a decision based upon how many lives he can change and affect. 
This is a person who's looking and asking the question, how can I be of service to the God and the Christ who sacrificed his life for me? How can I best serve? And when you see somebody like that, they stand out. Not in the way the world, in the worldly sense, but in the spiritual sense, they stand out and they are worthy of respect. So you're looking for somebody that if you don't already have a respect for them, what's the point? Because that's something that you have already for that person. Look for the person you respect. Also, it says sincere. One little word, sincere. One little word, sincere. What does it mean to be sincere? It means that when you say something, people can take it for what you're saying. They can take it for what it's worth to them. They can understand that what you're saying is true. Sincere means to let your heart align or let your words align with your heart. And if you're truly not a lover of Christ, that insincerity will begin to manifest itself in your life. But if you're a faithful follower of Christ, you will be sincere. That means you will mean what you say. You will do what you say. You will do it in the way that, you, that you, it ought to be done. You will do it in the time frame in which you have promised to do it. It means you will live by your word. You are sincere in your faith. Also, it says not indulging in much wine. There is a qualifying word there, and it's the word much. It doesn't say that you cannot drink wine. It simply says that you must not indulge in much wine. Why? Well, Ephesians 5.18 tells us that. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so what is, what is the reason? Well, if we're going to serve as a deacon, if you're going to be a leader in the church or a minister in the church, then that means that you are given the responsibility of guiding and, and teaching and discipling and, and ministering to God's people. The word debauchery, this says that drunkenness leads to debauchery. Debauchery simply means excessive indulgence in sensual pleasure. Excessive indulgence in physical pleasure. So what I've also shared with this is this, that when a person begins to get intoxicated, who is in control of your life? And once you, once you begin to feel that intoxication coming over to you, who is in control of your life? It is whatever it is that you have drank, whatever it is that you have taken, that's what's in control of your life. You're not full of the Holy Spirit. You are full of the wine, the alcohol. So the scriptures are clear. It's not telling us that you can't touch alcohol at all, but it is telling you that you cannot get drunk with wine. You cannot get drunk on alcohol or any other drug and be a servant in the church, be a deacon in the church. Pursuing dishonest gain. Now, again, there's a qualifying word. The word is dishonest. Okay? It's all right to seek and prosper. It's all right to make more money. It's all right to seek a better paying job. It's all right to seek to make a, a living and make a good living. It's all right to work for gain or to pursue gain in your life. It's okay to have some toys, guys. Yeah, it's okay. Not too many, but it's okay. In other words, we're not to pursue dishonest gain. Now, that sometimes, you know, I've, over all these years since, since I was uh, 31 years old, I've had to think about that because I've come, to, I've come in times where I'm selling something to somebody, a used whatever it is. I remember selling a boat one time that I had. It was a ski boat, and I was selling this boat to the guy, and, and it had several problems with it, and so I made sure I made a list of all the things, and I said, here's what I'm asking, but here's, here are the things that I know that are problems and you may have to deal with and everything. And, and so I tried to tell people, I tried to tell people, be honest with them, because I don't want to make something off of somebody that that's, lacks honesty. So even that... See, even at that level, and if you're working in a business, whatever it is, whatever your, whatever your way of making a living or making your income, it can't be through dishonest gain. By the way, the guy that bought the boat got so upset with me, he called me back later and said, hey, there's an engine mount under here that's weak and it's almost broken. 
I said, well, I didn't know there was an engine mount almost broken. So you can't be responsible for the things you don't know, but you should be honest about the things that you do. So I've had my fair share of unforeseen problems with things I had bought, right? Have you? Okay, just to say. That's another story too. The fifth thing, keep hold of the deep. I think this is probably the most important. Keep hold of the deep truth of the faith. Notice there are some qualifying words here too. It doesn't say just keep hold of the truths, but it, it adds a qualifier. It has something deeper. It says keep hold of the deep truth. Doesn't Paul teach us that there is the, 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 the milk for the immature, for the new, newly born again, but then there's the meat for those who have grown and are, and are driving deeper in their faith. God expects us to go from the shallow things to the deep things. Where are you in your walk? The person that you're looking for as a deacon is a person who understands the deep truths of God's word. They, they keep hold of those truths. There's a difference between knowing them and keeping hold of them, isn't there? Okay, they keep hold of the deep truths. How? With a clear conscience. I'm glad it doesn't say perfectly clear conscience. <laughs> because I think we all struggle at times with things in our lives. But my prayer for you would be this, that you're trying, seeking to hold on to the deep truths of God's word and his, and his, uh, his gospel. And at the same time, when, when you find yourself straying, when you find yourself not living into what you know, we confess that sin. And when we do, the scripture says that he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so that is how we keep a clear conscience, okay? We keep a clear conscience by keeping our sin before God. We don't let those things grow. We acknowledge them. We say, well, I'm tired of acknowledging the same old sin. Well, don't do it anymore, but still confess it when you do. It's okay. Just keep coming back for the grace of God. It is holding the truth, the deep truths of God's word with a clear conscience. How do we keep a clear conscience? Through repentance and through confession and honesty before God and before others. The last thing it says is that let, uh, uh, they must be tested first. What does it mean to test something? It doesn't mean just sitting down with a piece of paper and marking true, false, or selecting multiple choice. That's not the only kind of test. When we test something, we're, we're looking to see if it is what it says it is or if it performs like it says it performs. You put it to the test. You know, the Bible says that God never tempts us with sin, but he tests us on an ongoing basis. Why? Because it's through testing that we grow stronger. You know, the way they, they make the metal hard in a knife or in a sword is by plunging it into the fire and then putting it into the, to the water. And that, that tempers that steel. It makes it strong. It tests it. God is constantly testing us. And this tells us that someone that is going to be elected and nominated, uh, nominated and elected and ordained as a deacon should be someone that has has kind of lived a tested life thus far. Now, going back to my ordination, I will say this, that from the time Don and I got, got captured by the Spirit of God in a powerful way, uh, just a revival in our lives, and as we got back into the church, I, we were doing it, we really did, we were doing it with our whole heart. I mean, just anything and everything the Lord could put in our hands, and we, could, we wanted to do something for God's glory. But, and, and that was the test. Even though I was young, when it came time to, to be nominated as a deacon, there were those that could already see and said, he's tested. Even though I was young, he's tested. It, it, see, being a novice isn't a matter of age. That's what Paul said to Timothy. Don't let anyone look down on you because of your age. Why? Because Timothy had already been tested even at a young age. So let the ones be tested. That is the life of a deacon. It is simply the life of integrity, the life of character, the life of doing what you say you will do, when you say you will do it, the way it's supposed to be done, and living out the qualities in the character, holding on to the deep truths of the word and, and telling others about it. You see, deacons sometimes moving from 
you know, the first deacons in the book of Acts chapter 6 were told that they were first elected and called, the first seven, to help the disciples serve tables and take care of widows. But did you know that later Stephen, one of the deacons, in the streets of Jerusalem, as he was being stoned to death because of his testimony for Christ, saw the heavens open and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. He was, and as he did that, whose life was he touching? A lot of men and women, a lot of people watching, but the apostle Paul was there. Saul. Saul went on because of Stephen's testimony. The Spirit of God moved on him, and Saul became the one who would later write most of the New Testament. Same thing is true for Philip. Philip, the deacon, out uh, in the wilderness, and he sees an Ethiopian high official coming, going back to Ethiopia, and, and he's telling, he's riding along, telling this Ethiopian about Jesus, giving him the gospel. He went from serving the tables to widows, and now he's proclaiming the gospel to a lost soul. And what happens? That lost soul gets saved. He baptizes him, and he goes, goes to Ethiopia, and many scholars uh, believe that he was one that impacted the gospel spread in Ethiopia and in Africa. So God will use you, and when you're tested, he will use you for even greater things. The second thing is a deacon's family. Deacon's family is very important. And this is what it says, verses 11 and 12. In the same way, in the same way as the men, in the same way, and we're talking here about the deacon's wives, in the same way the women are to be worthy of respect, just like the men. The wives of a deacon, just like their husbands, should be people worthy of respect. Some have seen women who are worthy of respect and a husband who isn't. And sometimes you've seen a husband who is worthy of respect and a wife who isn't. But in God's house and in God's family, you will often find a husband and wife who are worthy of respect. Not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. Why do you think God, the writer of this, put this among the women and not among the men? Look, I'm not being judgmental. <laughs> Trying not to. <laughs> but there's an issue of integrity and there's an issue of sincerity involved here. And I think the scriptures are clear that one of the qualities of both a deacon and his wife are people that manage and control their tongues. They don't speak out of turn. They don't gossip. They don't say ugly or mean things about other people. They control their speech. They are not malicious talkers. You see, there's not that you can't be talkers. You see that, right? It's okay to be talkers. Where's Francis? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Wherever you are, Francis. It's okay to be talkers, but it's not okay to be malicious talkers. Saying things with evil intent or with wrong intent or malicious intent, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. Temperate. What are we talking about? We were talking about a drinking of alcohol a while ago. The scriptures call us to be moderate and temperate in all things. And so the wife of a deacon is to be temperate in these things. Worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, temperate and trustworthy in everything. Not some things, everything. And a deacon must be faithful to his wife. Now the scripture says, some translations say, the husband of one wife, and this has been a great uh, uh, Kind of a conflict in the church for many years. Can a, uh, you know, can a man who has been married and divorced or, or married and widowed, can that man then become a deacon because uh, the husband of one wife has been uh, thought to mean that one wife for life and, the, and once that wife is dead and gone or divorced, then you cannot be a deacon any longer, okay? Well, there's a lot. In, there, in fact, there's a whole series we could preach on that. But let me just say that based upon every study that I've done, and I've done some extensive study on this, that this is talking about a deacon must be faithful to his wife. In other words, the scripture even that's translated, if you'll look at the translation that we're looking at today, it says in verse 12, a deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children. Faithful to his wife. 
So the, the actual translation of the Greek in this passage is, would be most, mo, more carefully, more accurate to say the husband, or rather a one-woman man. A one-woman man. That means that you're faithful to the one that you have pledged your life to. And the woman should be faithful to her husband. So the last thing is he, she must manage uh, he must manage his children and his household well. Notice the word manage. It doesn't say that the children and the wife and the family is going to be perfect, does it? It doesn't say that, the, that this must be a man whose wi wife is perfect and his children are beyond, uh, beyond flaws. No. It says that he must manage his children. Now, let me just say, some of you know very well that you have had children that are a little bit harder to manage than everybody else. Right? And sometimes you look and say, God, how come they get one that behaves like that and I get one that behaves like this? <laughs> and you know that some of you were that kid. <laughs> right? That's what my parents thought. <laughs> it just means we manage your family. You don't let them go. It, doesn't mean, it means that you just don't let them run amok. You just don't give any guidance, any direction. You don't use any discipline. By the way, it's okay to discipline your children regardless of what the woke world says. It's okay to discipline your child. You should discipline your child if you love that child. And I believe a child that grows up without discipline actually grows up in the long run feeling unloved. Never damage or harm your child. Discipline is always for their betterment and never for their hurt, never to punish, but to discipline and train. Can you just manage your children, manage your family? You know, sometimes rather than covering up issues where we're having problems, maybe it would be better if we were just honest with one another and that we could help one another. Not, we're not here to judge each other, are we? No. We're here to help one another. The last thing is a deacon's reward. A deacon's reward, verse 13. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Those who have served well, there's a qualifier. Not just those who have served, but those who have served well. Because as you know, that uh, among churches, among pastors, among deacons and elders all over, that there are some who serve and they're there, they fill a position. But I've been told one time that we need to actually fill the position that we occupy. Fill the position that you occupy. Some are good, some are deserved, some are not. Those who have served well gain, there's the reward, gain an excellent standing. An excellent standing where? Well, I think it's an excellent standing in the church, an excellent standing in the body of Christ as a whole, an excellent standing in the kingdom of God, and I believe an excellent standing before Jesus Christ. One day, one, we will stand before him, and he will say what? He will say prayerfully, well done. I want to be a deacon, I want to be a pastor, I want to be a servant who stands before the Lord and hears him say, hey Dale, well done, faithful servant. And I know that you want the same thing. So when, you, when you're nominating deacons, you have to look at that aspect. And when, you're tr or when you are thinking about the nomination yourself, see, you remember, it's not about you. I have to tell myself that all the time. In fact, uh, that's a little thing I have in my head sometimes at plays. That is, it's not about me. This isn't about me. This isn't about me. If it is about me, that's a different thing. But it's, most of the time, it's not. And this great standing and our assurance is not about us. It's about him. He says, and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. You know, see, I have found that people that are just sincere and devoted and are just giving themselves and being the person that God has called them to be. As we live into that life, what I found is in my life, the, the longer I lived that life, the longer I was faithful, the longer I held to the deeper truths with a clear conscience, the longer I did that, the more confident I feel in the presence of God. Not arrogant, but simply confident that we grow in our, in our sense of confidence and peace in who we are in Christ. As you look for deacons in our church, just look for those men of high standing, of great character, and willingness to sacrifice themselves. And if you're here today, listen, 
thinking that, well, what does this have to do with me except for I'm going to nominate somebody? You know what? Every one of these points are true, should be true for all of us. Because you see, the qualifications we just named as deacons, those qualifications are simply things in which they are being examples to us to live the same kind of life. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for speaking to us, Lord. Uh, we pray for our church as we enter into this time of nominating deacons for the service to the kingdom in this, in this place. God, I pray that you would begin to open people's hearts. Lord, help us to look and to be able to see those that you are holding up that have that kind of character, that have that kind of spirit, that have that kind of peace and passion and love for others. Lord, please guide us in this time, we pray. Lord, if there's anyone here that's never trusted you as Savior and Lord, Lord, I pray that right now as we enter in this time of invitation, Lord, that you would speak and we would hear what your Spirit is saying. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we go into this time of invitation? If you're that one that's here, maybe you've never given your heart and your life to Christ and he's calling you right now, then I invite you to come. Come right now. But as we worship together this morning, open your heart to the Lord and ask him to give direction and guidance in your life, that you might be that kind of person and that you might see that kind of person when it comes to nominations as we worship together. Jesus is tenderly calling you home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will you roam farther and farther away? Calling today, calling today. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Jesus is calling. can be seated. Thank you so much. First of all, before anything else, I want to ask you to take the, your connection cards out that you filled out at the beginning of the service. If you will pass those to the center aisle for us, our ushers will pick those up. Thank you so much for doing that. That's how we kind of keep up with people in the church and what's going on in your lives. Tonight is business meeting at five o'clock, business meeting right here at the church. Uh, if you weren't aware of that, this is tonight, okay? And it's when we take care of the business and the direction of what's happening at McQueenie Baptist Church. We invite everybody to come and be a part of that. Five o'clock right here in the auditorium. Also, next Saturday, June the 10th, uh, we are having men's breakfast. Guys, men's breakfast, great time of fellowship, not to mention some awesome food, bacon and eggs and biscuits and that stuff this Saturday, okay? Nine o'clock, along with a great testimony, uh, we're going to hear from one of our members on that day. Uh, backyard VBS kickoff. We're doing two va vacation Bible schools, okay? We're going after kids. 
okay, in this neighbor, in this community. The first one is going to be a neighborhood community vacation Bible school. It's going to be down near um, McQueenie Estates at the v VFW Hall there. We're doing the kickoff this Saturday, and then the, the, the uh, vacation Bible school will start on Monday, and it only goes for three days. This is kind of an in-the-neighborhood backyard a vacation Bible school reaching out to kids in the community. And then uh, we will, by the way, have another in July, a full-blown vacation Bible school here at the church. Also, um, final thing, deacon nominations. Let me just mention to you, uh, as we begin that today, we will want to have those back by uh, June the 25th. Okay, but you can turn them in any time. There is a box uh, located on the table at the back of the auditorium. It says deacon nominations on top. So when you bring those in, uh, just mark them, bring them in, drop them in that box, and uh, we will take care of it from there. So please be in prayer. Uh, really ask God to give direction. And I know one of the challenges we have right now that I'm aware of, and we have to, we're going to have to think about this as a church because as the churches grow, you know, how you do things, sometimes the structure used at one level, this doesn't work very well at a different level of different numbers. So we're in that place right now. I know that we have two services, and maybe you don't know, feel like you don't know everybody in, bo in, all this, in the whole church, and I've heard so many people, especially those that sit in the choir, say, I see so many new faces, so many new people. And so it's hard to know everybody. Pray, ask God's direction, and, uh, and just ask him to, to surface for you. God will do that if you will ask him. And if you will prayerfully seek, he will do that. So, so do that. Return those forms. Drop them in the box. And I want to say thanks to Boyd Patterson for making that cool box back there. He's a guy's good with his wood, woodwork, man. So thanks, Boyd. And so uh, that, that's it for today. Just keep those things in your prayers. Bring those nominations back. After that, our deacon body will begin to process those, and we will kind of tell you as we go forward uh, the, process, the progress, okay? All right. Thank y'all so much for being here today. I pray that you have a great Lord's Day from here on out. Look forward to seeing. Don't forget, this is, I almost forgot the most important thing today. And that is that as soon as we dismiss, we're going to, during the time that we have, the 30 minutes between this service and the next, we're going to do baptism during that time. Now, there's a few th refreshments in the, in the fellowship hall, but what we're asking is for you. Uh, we'll take a break. You can get up, go to the restroom. The, the baptism won't happen for about 10, 50, maybe 15 minutes into the break. So about uh, 10, 40 or 10, 45, we will begin the baptism. So you'll just come back in here, gather. Those that are coming in for the second service, we're going to invite them in. We'll do the baptism, and then uh, we will break and be ready for the second service. I hope all that makes sense, but uh, prayerfully looking forward to it in just a few minutes. Okay, let's all stand together. As we go to the Lord this morning in prayer, I'm going to ask Perry Carrier, if he would, to lead us. Lord, bless us today and thank us for the kind words that we hear today with Dale. Lord, bless the baptism for all the sweet bless the church. And just bless our country and all of us. Amen.